Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miss Music Teacher, James C. Smith, and Miranda Janelle. Coming up on DTNS, Netflix ups the fight against password sharing, why Gen Z doesn't use Google, and Will Smith is here to talk about the democratization of broadcasting. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, the co-host of the Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod podcast is the Will in that podcast name. Will Smith, welcome. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, man. Uh, I can't wait to talk about sort of the overview of how much easier it is to do broadcasting than when all of us started this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it turns out it's a little bit of a different vibe now like like everything that used to be expensive is cheap and now it's easy yeah. so here we are which is good it's good for everyone but let's start with a few tech things you should know Samsung Mobile's unofficial, rather official, Twitter account appears to have confirmed the date of its next unpacked event as August 10th, 2022. It was in a series of cryptic images, including letters, numbers, and symbols, and a variety of tweets, colored circles that together can all be decoded as 081022, as in August 10th, 2022. Get it? A recent leak from Evan Blass, a.k.a. EvLeaks on Twitter, suggested the same date. Current rumors include an announcement of a Galaxy Fold 4 and a Galaxy Flip 4, plus the Galaxy Watch 5 and Watch 5 Pro. I was thinking it was going to be OU812, but I was wrong. Uh, Delaware Chancery Court Judge Kathleen McCormick has set the trial between Twitter and Elon Musk to take place for five days in October. Twitter is suing Elon Musk for breach of contract in relation to his agreement to purchase Twitter. Twitter had asked for a date in September. Musk requested a date in April. And the judge said, neither of you get it. We're due in October. Qualcomm announced an updated wearables platform called Snapdragon W5 Plus and W5 replacing the current Snapdragon Wear branding. The 4 nanometer W5 Plus chip is made for premium smartwatches, with the W5 meant for devices like smartwatches for kids, fitness trackers, and some enterprise devices. The platform's hybrid architecture is the same as in Snapdragon Wear 3100 and 4100 trips, although Qualcomm says that 50% longer battery life and double the performance and a 30% reduction in size is part of why W5 Plus will be better with multi-day battery life in some cases. Cases. The Oppo Watch 3 will be the first with the W5 in August, and the first Wear OS 3 watch will be M Mobby's TikTok watch running the W5 Plus later this autumn. Google announced it will let developers of non-gaming apps on the Play Store in the European Economic Area, that's the EU plus a few other countries, use alternative billing systems for in-game transactions. Developers will be charged 3% less than they would if they use Google's own system, which is... A little bit different than what they're doing in Korea, where they give you a 4% discount. Google said they made the change in advance of the Digital Markets Act, which is uh, probably going to go into effect later this year in the EU. In other Google Payments news, Google began rolling out Google Wallet on Android in 39 countries, saying it will be available to all users over the next few days. In most countries, Wallet is going to roll out as an update to Google Pay, but... If you're in the U.S. or Singapore, Google Pay is sticking around as a way to send peer-to-peer -peer payments. Slack announced its first price increase since launching in 2014, effectively September 1st. Monthly pro plans increase 75 cents per month to 8.75 per user, while those paid annually increase 58 cents to 7.25 per user. Prices remain the same for teams on a Business Plus plan and enterprise customers as well. The free tier also gets some changes, shifting to saving saving the last 90 days of messages and uploads rather than showing the last 10,000 messages and 5 gigs of uploads. So they would like you to pay if possible. All right. Let's talk about something that matters. Let's do it. We have talked about Matter before. That's the project that's supposed to make it easier for smart home devices to interoperate no matter who makes them. One element of Matter is a low-powered networking protocol called Thread. So, Tom... Let us know a little more, shall we? What is Thread? Ah, indeed, I've been preparing an episode of Know a Little More on this. Thread is a mesh-type network, uh, and the oversimplified explanation is that each device on a mesh network can talk directly to every other device, no matter who made them. So essentially, each Thread device you get will be an access point, uh, so it can pass along information, and you don't need a special hub. That's the big difference between it and, say, Zigbee. Uh, Thread can't handle a lot of data, though, and its range is 
about the same as Zigbee, 200 to 300 meters. That's why Matter also supports Wi-Fi if you need high data or Bluetooth low energy for lower range for longer ranges. But the mesh network means that Thread works great for sensors uh, that are near to other sensors or other devices that are in the Thread network that can pass along the data. Thread's faster, more reliable, a little more secure, and more interoperable than previous protocols, but it cannot connect to the internet on its own. So you don't need a hub, but if you want cloud control or if you want to be able to talk to non-thread devices in some cases, you do need something that they call a border router, something that can talk to the thread devices, but also talk to the internet. Which brings us to the news today. Thread 1.3.0 just dropped, which lets any thread device work with any thread border router. Don't let the word router confuse you. It does not have to be a traditional internet router, although it can be. Thread is backwards compatible, so a current Thread device can upgrade to Thread 1.3.0 for the increased capability and compatibility. The Verge notes that the following devices will support Thread 1.3.0 with a software update, the Nest Hub Max smart display in the second gen of the same, the Nest Wi-Fi mesh router, Apple TV 4K, Apple HomePod Mini, Amazon Echo fourth gen smart speaker, Nano Leaf Shapes, Elements, and Lines LED light panels, and the Wi-Fi 6 versions of Eero mesh routers or newer. If you have more than one of those, you're going to want to pick one to control the network. Otherwise, the mesh won't work as well because you'd have competing mesh networks. You'd, you'd have separate ones. You want them all in the same so you get the meshiness of it. Uh, expect more manufacturers, though, to join as devices uh, just need an always-on power source and an internet connection to become uh, one of those border uh, routers. This unifies Thread, so all Thread devices can now work with each other. Thread 1.3.0 also requires devices to use TCP for firmware more updates so you can update your device all at one time uh, you can update them all at once uh, and update them remotely you won't have to stand near it with your phone anymore which you had to do with some of them uh, we will have a full episode describing thread coming on know a little more.com this thursday uh, but will how are you feeling about matter and thread so i was a little bit worried about it because you know it's, it's the old xkcd right is like you have <laughs> Eight standards. So it's like this. The standard kind of sucks. We should add another standard, and then next thing you know, there's another standard. Um, but talking to people who work in the industry, uh, Paul Schautzen from Home Assistant, some other folks that are that are close to this, are pretty excited about it and think that it solves a lot of the problems with Zigbee and Z-Wave and the existing kind of low-level infrastructure um, uh, protocols that are around now. Scott, you excited? Yes, because for years now, you've been telling me about mesh networks, and, and I say that seriously. For at least two, three years, Tom has tried to help me understand why a mesh network might be cool. And I feel like we're finally getting there where it would matter to me. So if this is it, great. But I still worry about that next best standard thing. And, you know, a year from now, you telling me that, oh, forget all that. Now there's this. Yeah. Forget this, the thousand bucks you spent. You're I good. mean, I, I'm right there with you. This Hopefully this is the exception that proves the rule. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yep. Well, you might have heard that Netflix is expanding its test of detecting out-of-home use on accounts. People sharing their accounts with others, and the company is asking people to pay more for those out-of-home users. In Argentina, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic, users may be prompted to add a home and pay $2.99 per month extra. It's $1.17 in Argentina. If Netflix can detect that a user is outside of the house and it's using the service for more than two weeks. So it's kind of like you're not on vacation. You're somebody else. Users can add one extra home to a basic account, two to a standard account, and three to a premium account. This is different than the test going on in Costa Rica, Peru, and Colombia, where users are asked to add up to two extra sub accounts if users outside a home are detected. So... Let's explain how they differ, Scott. All right. On its support page, this is what Netflix says. You can watch Netflix on your laptop, your mobile device while traveling. Uh, both those things are fine. Uh, but Netflix sp specifically says if you're watching on a TV, you can watch up to two weeks at a location outside your home. And this is allowed once per location per year. Now, Kind of interestingly, The Verge reported the support page for this in Honduras originally read... After that time, meaning two weeks, the TV will be blocked unless you add the extra home. However, that language seems to have been removed. Mm, well, to help uh, manage people you may have a shared password with, your kids, your mom, your dad, whatever, intentionally or not, Netflix uh, soon will let you see where your account is being used and give you the option to sign out of that location. 
So how does it determine if you're inside your own house or not? Yeah, Netflix actually gave us some details uh, this time. Not not full details, but it says it's using information such as IP addresses, device IDs, and account activity. So using a VPN might trip this. Netflix, in fact, gives troubleshooting tips for users who may get the add a home prompt when they're at home in their primary loca location. Uh, among the tips are make sure that the device is not connected to a VPN, proxy, or any unblocker service. Uh, it also recommends connecting to the same internet connection as other devices in the home. Uh, unblocker service coming shortly before Netflix adds ads uh, to their service. How convenient is that? Uh, but yeah, so they're saying, look, we're looking at VPN. And if you're running a VPN and that VPN IP address says you're in San Jose, but you're really in Los Angeles, that 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 could trip this the system. The 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 whole um, language was removed that said, and if you don't if you do this for more than two weeks, you're going to get cut off. I think it's still implied that they would cut you off or else they wouldn't even bother with any of this. I have to assume that Netflix wants to tread carefully. They don't want to lose a bunch of users, had kind of a rocky quarter as of late. So yeah, I wonder when that language comes back and, and what it'll say. Yeah, but because in the Costa Rica, Peru, Colombia one that you mentioned, where they just add, ask you to add an account, not add a home, they aren't cutting you off. It really is just a like, hey, you should pay. Please do. In good faith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they know that that'll get a, a, a number of people to do it, uh, which is better than, than nobody doing it, right? Because they bring in extra revenue. So it felt like it was a little more aggressive for them to say, no, we're going to hard enforce this. And maybe they're backed off on the hard enforcement. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, to, <laughs> I'm kind of with Sarah. I'm kind of scratching my head. Like if you're going to say that you're going to turn you, turn your account off, but then pull that language, but not but not loosen the rules or not uh, address it in some other way. That just mm -hmm. tells me they're gonna they're gonna kill it. So I have this feeling, and I don't know I'm not in some of the affected areas that we're talking about today, but I have this feeling that I need to like get a hold of all my kids, talk to my mom, talk to my sisters, and just make sure, hey, who's using who's what right now? Because I don't know. I have no idea. I don't remember who who maybe is sharing a thing, or maybe I'm sharing somebody something. I don't think so because I pay for Netflix, but. It's all a little bit confusing. So I don't know. As long as they give people plenty of notice and say, yeah, it looks like if this is happening over here and communicate this stuff well, it'll probably be okay. It, it's anyway. an interesting choice to go after this really hard now, too, when they're also seeing like – problems with users on the on the content side like their their content isn't resonating now there's a lot of like industry articles in the hollywood press about this on the regular about how you know they keep launching new shows and they're not seeing any pickup they're not, their movies aren't landing and you know like to go after users for sharing accounts at this point feels a little bit tone deaf when the content's not resonating it seems like it's an easy decision to just turn the key. Well, I, I would characterize this as going easy, right? Because they're starting in limited countries. They're, they pulled back from the block thing. I feel like Netflix is trying to just see what kind of effect this is going to have. But the reason they're doing it is because they aren't making the amount of money that they need to make off the existing user base. And they've reached saturation in a lot of markets like the United States. So they their only way to make more money is to go after that incremental revenue because they just can't add more people. Uh, and th that explains why they're doing it at all. Uh, like you say, though, uh, is it going to risk driving people away? Well, it would be driving people away who don't pay. So maybe that doesn't matter. I don't know. Yeah. Might be fine. Yeah. Uh, but Netflix also added Into the Breach as one of its mobile games included with your Netflix subscription. Into the Breach won Best Strategy Game at the 2018 Game Awards. Uh, there's a bit of new content in the Netflix version, and it has been adapted for mobile. If you're a Netflix subscriber, you can just access it with your Netflix account. No additional charge. That's an excellent game. It's actually a really good get for them. I don't know if it's a timed thing or what the deal is, and it's not a brand new game, so probably they have some levity there, what they, uh, what they can do with it. Um, or leverage. But I have to keep... I, or leverage is what I meant. Levity sure would mean it would be funny and they'd have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to at least mention that they had another hit on their hands that I don't know if enough people know about. And that game's called Point P. It came out last year or last month, rather, and um, was by the Downwell developer. It is a fantastic vertically held phone game that doesn't have any microtransactions other than what you pay for Netflix. Just wanted to slide that in. Great yeah. recommendation. Great game. And you can play it outside your home. Yeah. Uh, our job here on DTNS is to help you understand tech better. And there was a story last week I think worth bringing up. Uh, last week, Google Senior Vice President Prabhakar Raghavan said at the Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference, 
Quote, in our studies, something like almost 40% of young people when they're looking for a place for lunch don't go to Google Maps or search. They go to TikTok or Instagram. This is some internal data from surveys Google did of people between the ages of 18 and 24. Raghavan said younger people are generally interested in more visually rich forms of search and discovery. Sarah, <laughs> this shocked you. It did. Okay, so this morning I read this and I was like, what? How does that even work on TikTok? Maybe there's some like features of TikTok I don't know about. So I typed in lunch near me. That didn't work because TikTok's like, what? That's, you know, I just got like weird videos where that was in a caption. So I was like, okay, hmm, let me pick a town near me, Sebastopol, California, which is like one town over from where I am. Lunch in Sebastopol. And I did get some hits and there were you know, certain places, a few of them I've actually been to, but let's just say I was looking for, I don't know, a ramen place kind of thing. I can watch the TikTok. Sure. There's, you know, uh, maybe a person narrating. It. It's very TikTok-y. You see like beautiful, you know, bowls of noodles and, you know, maybe some appetizers. And it's like, yeah, in the, you know, in the data that you can see, it does say Sebastopol. It's been tagged there, but there's nowhere to click on it to see a map. You don't get directions. You don't have user reviews. And I know I sound like an old, but I'm like, okay, I can see sort of starting here to say, I just like to get a sense of the place and then going to Google to get more information about how actually to get there and what their hours are and if they're open right now and maybe I can make a reservation. I don't know how younger people are using TikTok and to a lesser extent Instagram for this kind of information. Mm. I mean, part of it is we, you and I, I, I'm with you on this. You and I expect a uh, um, functional transfer of information to action, right? We want to go yeah. search for restaurants near me, look at some quick reviews, get directions, drive or call an order or whatever. Like we yeah. want those steps. And I think if I'm to guess, and I know Tom's going to tell us all about this, but if I had to guess, if you're 12 years old to 18 years old, as an example, you're using it to search for stuff you're into right then that really has no applicable uh, sort of daily need. It's just, I oh, I heard about this band. I'm going to find it here. Oh, I heard about this stupid meme. I'm going to find it here if I search for it. I think those are the things they're looking for. They're not trying to find the closest Home Depot yet. When they get there, they're going to need the tools we have. But I think right now, the stuff they're wanting, the things they're looking if, for, are just aren't practical in terms of what you and I are looking for at the moment. But I mean, in the case of uh, what Raghavan said, you know, and he used looking for a place for lunch, that all that stuff does matter because we, yeah. you're not going to fly across the country to go get lunch. We are That's guilty true. of Gen X think right now. And how could we I not know. be? That's who we are. But we think top down. We think, oh, Google is the search engine where you find information. I think if I have this right, and please, Gen Z folks in the audience, let me know if I got even close. It's you are using TikTok and Instagram. You find out about places and you see them and you're like, that place looks cool. That place is cool. I'm going to save that for later. Share that with a friend. Do you want to go there? Once you've decided, then you might use Google to like, oh, is it open and where is it? Uh, but but it's the last part of the step. It's not you don't go to Google to be like, oh, find a place to eat. It's it's I don't know. Will you you brought up the word experiential when we were talking about this earlier today. Well, I, I mean, I think that's it. It's it's like you you watch the you watch the the video of the person making the taco salad on the countertop, and you're like, I'm never going to do that. It's novelty. It's interesting. I watch food videos all the time to find stuff that I don't know about. You know, whether it's you know just Detroit style pizza with the hard cheese crust on the edge or or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, I, I, but I'm probably not going to use TikTok as an old to go out and 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 find the the pizza place near me. I'm gonna I'm gonna look for the I'm gonna learn about the thing. On TikTok, and then I'm going to go search for it on Google like a, any decent human being. <laughs> <laughs> or DuckDuckGo or Brave or wherever you're at. Yeah, sure. We don't want to judge. I definitely judge. get the idea of saying, let's see what the vibe is like. And TikTok feels maybe a little bit more alive than the photos that you're going to see on a Google search or just on the internet in general. Or maybe the restaurant's own website. I get that. It just seems like it's a first step, sure. Perhaps an unnecessary one. I, Again, well, I, just, I did a little math while we were here. Not math, but a little research. My son, who's a Gen Z, and his girlfriend, also Gen Z. I just asked them while we were talking, hey, have either of you used TikTok as a search engine? And their replies came back. My son says, is that even possible? I do not, he says. His <laughs> girlfriend says, honestly, I think I do every once in a while, but only if I'm looking for specific TikToks. Uh, sometimes I'll see, she's going on here, I'll, I'll summation it here, but she says, 
basically if there's a if there's a restaurant or an account that does restaurants here in Salt Lake City, she'll follow that account and go to that account often to hear what they're talking about. Oh, we're going to try that hot dog place next time we're here. But they don't need to go look up a bunch of other stuff until the day they go, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like piecemeal. It's like, well, I'll watch this and get inspired, but then I'll hop over to my Maps app or my Google search or whatever to get a little more if I need it. Otherwise, I'm just here to be entertained, get the info and get out. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, it's kind of what my wife does, who's younger in spirit than all of us. Uh, she she <laughs> finds great places on TikTok, TikTok marks them for later, you know, and then then we go eat there, and it's delicious. Yeah. I uh, think LA is the most TikToky of the U.S. cities, though. Too, it may be. Tom. It may yeah. be. Yeah, there may Very be a cultural much. bias that I that I'm living inside of for sure. Uh, it's special guest week here on DTNS all week long. If you like what you're hearing, uh, spread the word, tell your friends, uh, to watch or listen to daily tech news show all this week. Cause we got great people on the show. Like will Corsair announced it's integrating NVIDIA's broadcast audio and video features into its IQ and Elgato software. So you don't need a separate app anymore to do noise removal or add virtual backgrounds or all that stuff. As long as you have a compatible headset, microphone or camera and an NVIDIA RTX GPU. This kind of news, along with things like Stream Deck and Rodecaster, are making it easier than ever to broadcast from wherever you want. 15 years ago, this kind of broadcast tech was limited to niche or traditional media outfits that could afford the technology and the server fees for the broadband. Now people in homemade studios like the ones we're in can compete for the same audiences as traditional broadcasters. Will, you've been following this trend and participating in it for years. What do you think is behind this democratization of broadcast tech? Well, uh, so Tom, there's a bunch of different stuff, right? One is One is that you know, broadband is accessible now and most people can get decent broadband where they are. Um, but I think the, the bigger thing is that phones have brought down the cost of a, a bazillion different kinds of chips, whether it's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and, and networking stuff, whether it's audio uh, uh, ADCs, I guess, audio to digital converters, uh, cameras, things like that are, are all cheaper because we're shipping billions of them every year in phones. Uh, you know, in the old days when you used to leave the house, I did these. Talk, I did a talk about how you could tell the future by looking at the cost at what Apple and Samsung and Google were putting in their their phones for the next year. And if you look at like 2007, the cost of an accelerometer chip, which is just what what you know tells you if the phone's moving, nothing else. They were like 23 cents a pop. Uh, a year later, when the iPhone 3G came out with an accelerometer in it, I think it, the the cost of that chip went down to a tenth of a cent. And then two years after that, it was just integrated in the SOC and became essentially free for anybody who was using an ARM SOC. Um, so, so like that stuff has combined to make the thing that that you know we were building at Future, you guys were building at CNET, or even in, at, when we started Whiskey in the late two thousand late two thousands, I guess we spent one hundred and fifty grand setting up a studio with a couple of cameras, a couple of three cameras, an audio board, a video switcher, and and stuff like that. And now you have a computer. You, you spend a couple hundred bucks on a camera, a couple hundred bucks on a microphone. You're pretty much, and, and some lights, you're pretty much there. It, it turns out I just, I packed it all up in the car and came on vacation with it earlier this month. So it's it's a little bit more accessible. It's a little bit easier to get to uh, than it was in the past. And and um, the software side is also incredibly relevant to that too. You know, in 2000, 2000, in 2000, there was no software to stream with, right? You bought Wirecast or something that was phenomenally expensive and bespoke. And now you just download a copy of OBS, which is an open source uh, program that's been in development now for what twelve years. I, I think I think it, I think they started. Um, I think uh, Jim posted the first version of OBS in like twenty twelve mm -hmm. uh, when Twitch was new. So yeah, he he. he a guy, some guy wanted to stream some StarCraft, didn't want to pay the 50 bucks for whatever the software was at the time and, and wrote his own version of a, of a video compositor. And, and now it's this thing that millions of people around the world use uh, and probably including us. I don't know what you all, what your all's background yeah, looks like. I but. totally do. Yeah. And then the cool thing about OBS in that particular case is those tools are not only incredibly simple, but given its open source nature and how long it's been bouncing around uh over these years it's easily the most stable version but there are also forks of it that Streamlabs uses and they've got their own development path and there are others that are doing it as well but i don't think any of us predicted that this you know at the time janky little video game streaming software in the earliest days of twitch and the waning days of justin tv was going to end up being such a standard for way more than that people who aren't gamers at all people on Macs, people all over the place using obs in ways that 
basically give them a broadcast center in their at their fingertips and and they're getting it for free which is uh, you know which is awesome and it's still the best thing out there i love it yeah, yeah it's it's um it's interesting because we saw this accelerate kind of when the pandemic started everybody started working from home and you know there'd been this cottage industry for streamers and people who wanted to, to uh, you know make videos for youtube and stuff like that for a long time but then all of a sudden we're all stuck at home we're all you know turning our extra bedroom or whatever into an office and you know, everybody's buying microphones, everybody's buying, you know, good microphones and, and good lights and all of that kind of streamer cottage industry hardware became a really important part of like the business world too. So it's, it's been, it's been a really, it's been fascinating to watch and it's, it's really exciting from a content creator perspective because it means that the bar for entry is so much lower than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, for sure. And the more the more that you see this stuff come out of major makers of software, hardware, and whatever, the 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 more at home this stuff will be. I do worry a little bit that now it's getting wrapped up in some gardens a little bit. Nvidia's garden, in particular, here they control a lot of this stuff now, and almost all of it hinges on their RTX GPUs, uh, which for a while there were impossible to get. I know that's gotten better lately, um, but there's some issues with all of that. You know, I'd love this to be a little bit more. Everybody can use it no matter where they're at, what they're doing and what they're using. Um, but I, you know, that writing was on the wall. As the stuff becomes more popular, uh, obviously people are going to try to, to monetize it the best they can. And I like NVIDIA, but, um, you know, some of some of that pioneering tradition that that we all entered in in the, in the mid to late aughts is just a little bit off when it comes to, you know, now everybody, now all the corporations have their hands in it. And, and uh, I guess that's the story of everything. So I shouldn't be surprised, but here we are. Well, let's extrapolate a little bit then uh, to, to round this up. Uh, so in 1993, you needed a Grass Valley switcher and a, and a big location and a bunch of expensive, you know, three quarter inch tape recording cameras. Uh, and then 15 years ago, you could get some HD cameras and, and, and they were a little lighter and you could bond, you know, broadband uh, modems together for mobile. And then today we have the situation that Will just described where you can, you know, off the shelf through Amazon, spend a few hundred dollars. Where do you think this is going next, Will? Oh, that's that's fascinating. I think it's I think more than getting deeper in into these into this area. Like I don't microphones have been you know your 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 electro voice microphone has been the same price for the last forty years at this point, right? So I don't think microphones are going to get cheaper. But the thing that is going to start happening is we're going to see software eat more of those high end markets. So it's the same thing that happened with with DSLRs. Uh, and point and shoots have all been, you know, those those markets have been shrunk down to the point that only you know professionals buy DSLRs at this point, and enthusiasts who want the want all the features of the camera because everybody else is just you know using their iPhone and yeah, yeah. and the software is good enough. We're seeing the same thing happen with speakers with audio and like the the you know the Google Voice of the HomePod speakers versus Sonos and and stuff like that. So I, I think I think the the thing is the thing to ask yourself is what markets can we add software and smarts to that will see the same kind of enhancement that content creation and photography and stuff like that have. And, and I, th I think we're, I mean, it's impossible to say at this point, but um, I, I'm, I'm always looking to see what's next. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Fascinating stuff. All right. Let's, let's see what content has kicked out today, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an adventure game called stray uh, that became available today. It has you solving puzzles. You navigate an urban environment. You're pitted against powerful enemies. Sounds pretty, you know, like an adventure game, but you're also playing as a cat and you're seeing everything from the cat's perspective and you're doing things that cats do. Now, if the cat part isn't enough, you have also got a drone friend named B12 that they're helping you solve the mysteries of the world. Humans are sort of not around. It's all robots. The cat wants to know where the humans went. The cat never talks because everybody knows that cats don't talk, only in the movies. Along with lots of those adventures, uh, Stray will appeal to cat people because you can scratch up carpets and couches when you're not actually, you know, <laughs> trying to stay alive. You can ruin in progress board games. That's a thing cats like to do. You can lie down for a snooze if you like. Stray launches today on PS4, PS5, and Steam. I know Roger is world's biggest cat person, so go get him. <laughs> you going to get it, Roger? What's the plan? <laughs> uh, you, of course have, you are. You have a Steam I, account. You're getting yeah, it. Yeah, I, I have a Steam account. Uh, I'll just uh, load up on some uh, antihistamines and uh, I'll be set. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 
is if I, I, I asked some gamer friends, hey, you know, uh, anybody excited about this? And a couple of them were like, I don't know. That seems a little gimmicky. And then everyone else was like, cat game. Yes. Can't wait. I, I, I will say when I first heard about it uh, a while back, I was like, eh. But the more I hear about, the more interesting it is because it does kind of take you and shift you out of the very human centric perspective that most games uh, offer you, whether it's you know like a shooter or mm. or a sports game or anything. Yeah, it's a real get for PlayStation owners as well. This is an exclusive to them at least for now. And uh, on the computer side, we got it on Steam. I think that what makes these games interesting is that they're trying new things and mashing things up that we don't think about. So a cat. Uh, trying to figure out what to do in the world. Meanwhile, where are the humans? Why are we living in this cyberpunk uh, strangeness? What's with all the robots? Like these all these all speak to me, with the exception of the cat part, because I don't really like cats that much. But that's okay. <laughs> it's a video game. I don't like golf either, and I play golf video games, so I'm I'm kind of all in on this. I'm going to try it out this week. I, I well, go ahead, Will. Oh, I loaded it up this morning for about ten minutes, and I got to the part where it said press circle to meow. And then next thing I knew, I got an achievement for meowing a hundred times. So uh, I'm in. It's good. I, I, ten out of ten game of the year, as far as I'm concerned. I, I was going to say, I'm not sure if you're a real cat person or not, but you certainly are uh, when you are a cat uh, who is inside a game. Uh, Will Smith, go. thank you so much for being a great guest with us today. Cat person or not, we'd love to have you back soon. Let folks know where they can keep up with what else you do. So you can find me on Twitter at Will Smith. Uh, every week uh, I do a podcast with my friend Brad Shoemaker called Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod where we uh, break down a single topic generally. So uh, I was out last week because I had uh, the COVID. Uh, so we had a special guest on last week's episode uh, from JPL to come in and talk about what it's like to operate a uh, camera, uh, cameras on Mars. He was nice. the, the camera operator on the Curiosity rover for the hazard cams for a long time. And it's gotten a promotion since we recorded that episode. But um, but yeah, we break down a single topic and kind of dig deep into it. We're going to do some matter and thread stuff uh, in the next several weeks. Uh, and then uh, we also do the FOSS pod every other week, which we is a, is a deep dive interview with a uh, maintainer or creator of a, of a large open source project. So we've talked to the folks who maintain VLC, uh, Blender is coming up soon, OBS, a home assistant we mentioned earlier, a uh, bunch of other uh, amazing, you know, the, the open source projects that are changing the world. It's a, it's a small mandate. So uh, we have a lot of fun with both of those. And you can find them at, uh, at techpod.content.town. Very cool. Scott Johnson, good to have you today. Throwing everybody a curveball. It's Tuesday, not Wednesday. Uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was great to see you. Let folks know what uh, what else you do. I don't want it to be weird, but I did it because I knew Will was going to be here today, and we never seem to get on the same show. So uh, <laughs> I knew I could make this happen. But anyway, hey, Tuesday listeners. Uh, if you want to check out more of my stuff, you can find a stack of podcasts, a whole bunch of artwork and other things over at frogpants.com. Uh, in particular, check out the podcast and listen to one of my gaming shows. You might like Core a lot, for example, where we talk a lot about the stuff that got mentioned today. So go check all that out. That's at frogpants.com, and I'm on Twitter at Scott Johnson. We also have a brand new boss to thank. Matthew just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew. Matthew, get in the spotlight. Well done, Matthew. Slip a right hero. In. A yeah. hero to all. <laughs> There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet, a.k.a. GDI. It's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We roll right into it when we wrap up this show. But this show is live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Join us if you can. We'd love to have you. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Quinn Nelson from Snazzy Labs discussing whether the M1-powered MacBook is the best gaming laptop on the market. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>